we're often impatient in the practice. We want to go straight to insight, straight to the solution of all our problems, so we then can go back home and get on with the rest of our lives. But you first have to put the mind in good shape before you're going to gain any insight. You have to feed it well. That's what concentration is all about. As the Buddha once said, if you don't have the pleasure and rapture that can come from at least the first jhana, you're always going to be tempted by sensuality. Even if you understand the drawbacks of sensual pleasures, the drawbacks of sensual desires. If you don't have this alternative way of finding happiness, you're going to go back to your old ways. No matter how much dharma you may have read, or how precise your understanding of the intricacies of the Buddha's teachings, when the time comes to feed, you're going to go back and feed on the same old things you've been feeding on all your life. It's like a John Cha's simile. He said Westerners one time, he said Westerners are like vultures. When they fly, they fly very high, but when they eat, they eat low. That's one of those quotes you don't normally see in books about a John Cha. But it was very insightful. Because we do tend to overlook the need for the groundwork that's provided by concentration. The Buddha himself compared the happiness and pleasure, equanimity that come from concentration as kinds of food. He has the image of a fortress at the edge of a frontier, and different qualities in the path correspond to different aspects of the fortress. There's discernment, which is like a slippery wall that the enemy can't climb up. Mindfulness is like the gatekeeper, who remembers who to let in and who not to let in. And jhana, he says, is like stores of food. If I remember right, rightly, if the first jhana is like things like beans or rice. And then you work up to the fourth jhana, which is like honey and butter. These are ways of nourishing the mind. And providing for the mind's right livelihood, even if you don't have any higher levels of insight, at least you're finding pleasure in a blameless place. You could say that this falls under the factor of right livelihood in the path. The more pleasure, the more a sense of well-being and stability you can develop from within, the lighter your footprint on the rest of the world, the less harm you're doing in searching for your livelihood, both physical and, and mental. So as you're practicing concentration, you're developing several factors of the path all at once. There's right resolve, the resolve to renounce sensuality, to find a pleasure that's not involved with sensual passion. Right mindfulness, which is the theme of right concentration. And right livelihood, looking after your needs in a skillful way. Right livelihood is Kind of the poorest stepsister of the Eightfold Path. It's the factor that the Buddha hardly defines at all. He simply says the disciple of the Noble Ones avoids wrong livelihood and makes his or her living off of right livelihood. Doesn't tell you much. Part of it may be, have been simply a question of etiquette. There's only one passage in the canon where the Buddha clearly comes out in a general statement that there are five types of wrong trade, trading in poison, trading in weapons, 
trading in intoxicants, trading in meat, and trading in human beings as slaves. The disciple of the Noble Ones avoids those kinds of trade. You don't set yourself up with a shop to sell alcohol or poison or weapons, meat or slaves. But otherwise, the Buddha is very circumspect about talking about different people's occupations. There are two cases where people come to him. One case is an actor and the other is a soldier, a professional soldier. And they say pretty much the same thing. Our teachers who taught us to be actors, the actor says, said that if you spend your life entertaining people with your imitations of reality and making them laugh, you're going to go to the heaven of laughter. What does the Buddha have to say about that? And the Buddha refuses to answer twice. But the actor keeps after him and asks him a third time. So the Buddha finally says, well, it looks like I can't get anywhere with you by saying I don't want to answer that, so I'll answer it. He says, if as you're acting you give rise to greed, anger, and delusion in people, and your motivation for acting is greed, anger, and delusion, then after you die you're going to go to the, the la hell of laughter, i.e. not the place where people laugh with you, but the place where people laugh at you. And the actor breaks down and starts crying. And the Buddha says, see, I didn't want to answer your question. The actor says, no, I'm not crying because of what you said. I'm just really crying because I've been deceived by my teachers for so long. Similarly with a soldier. The soldier says, I was taught that if you die in battle, you're going to go to the heaven of heroes. What does the Buddha have to say about that? And again, the Buddha refuses to answer twice. And when pushed for the third time, he finally says, well, when you are in battle, and giving rise to the desire for the killing of other beings. May these other beings suffer, may they be harmed, may they be killed. That mind state, if you die in battle, is going to take you to the hell of the heroes and those who die in battle. And again, the soldier cries and the Buddha says, look, I said I didn't want to answer the question. And the soldier again says, no, I'm not crying for what you said, I'm just crying because I've been deceived for so long. The Buddha's etiquette here is interesting. He didn't set out to have a crusade against actors or actresses or against professional soldiers or advertising people or whatever. Only if he was pushed would he condemn a particular occupation. Otherwise, what he would have you do is have you reflect on your means of livelihood. Is it harming other beings? Does it involve lying? Does it involve unskillful mental states? If it is, maybe you should look for another occupation. This may have been one of the reasons why the Buddha had that etiquette, because a lot of people are stuck in their occupation. It's going to take a while for them to disentangle themselves if they find that it's unskillful. But there is another side to right livelihood, and that's looking at your attitude towards what you consume. This is one of the reasons why we have that chant every evening, looking back on our use of the requisites during the day. Why did you use the requisites? Actually, that chant is for when you didn't reflect while you were using the requisites. Actually, it's best if you reflect while you're eating. Why are you eating now? When you put on your clothes, why are you putting these clothes on? When you fix up your house, why are you fixing up your house in this way? When you take medicine, why are you taking medicine, this particular medicine now? What's your motivation? And he reminds you of the ideal motivation. You wear clothing to protect yourself from the elements, to cover up the parts of the body that cause shame. You take food not for putting on bulk, not for the fun of it, because after all, those who provided the food that you're eating didn't provide it in fun. The farmers who worked, the animals that gave up their lives. You take the food simply so that you can continue practicing, so you can eliminate hunger pains, and yet at the same time not overstuff yourself so that there's the pain that comes from eating too much. 
You're not eating just for the flavor of the food. You're eating simply for the nourishment of the body, so you can practice and ease. With shelter, you're supposed to take, have shelter simply to protect yourself from the elements and to provide a place where you can be quiet, find some privacy so you can practice. And again, for medicine, to eliminate pain and to maintain freedom from disease, that's all. And when you think about these things, what this does, it forces you to look at your impact when you eat, when you buy clothing, when you buy any of these things and use them. What is your impact on the world? Because the fact that you're alive and breathing means that you have a lot of needs, and the needs can be met only by relying on others. What way can you rely on others so that you're not harming them, causing them unnecessary pain? This ties in with one of the important principles of what they call the customs of the noble ones, which is contentment with your material things. When you think in these ways, okay, then you find that you're buying less, using less, because you're looking someplace else for your happiness, i.e. you're looking inside. And this is where the concentration comes in. This is why concentration is an important element of right livelihood. It provides you that honey and butter the grain, the other foods that you need for the mind, for your true happiness deep down inside. At the same time, this happiness provides you with a good foundation for the insights that are going to come as you start looking at the various ways in which you keep on taking birth. Because again, when you, the fact that you're taking birth is placing a burden on other beings, a burden on the world. And the insights that you're going to need in order to stop that process can be pretty harsh. As the Buddha said, when you, when you take food, think about the story of the couple who were going across the desert with their only child, and they got more than halfway across the desert and they were totally out of food. And they realized that if they didn't have any food, all three of them would die. And so they decided they would kill their child and make jerky out of the baby, baby jerky. And that way at least two of them would survive, and then they could start a family again when they got to the other side of the desert. Now the Buddha said, what would be their attitude toward the food while they were eating it? Would they be eating it for fun? No. They'd be thinking of sorrow, of all the what they'd had to do in this horrible circumstance. And the Buddha said, that's how you should regard fit physical food, not something you eat out of joy or for the flavor, but simply to keep life going, realizing that it's, it causes pain, it causes suffering, the fact that you have to eat. That's a harsh contemplation, and one of many harsh contemplations in the Buddha's teachings. And the only way the mind can stand up under that kind of contemplation is you've got a strong sense of well-being that comes from nourishing the mind with right concentration. Because otherwise the insights that can come from meditation, if you don't have a good solid foundation like this, can be disorienting and destabilizing. So as the foundation for your practice, you want to work on these skills. Keep at them. Appreciate this simple quality of getting the mind still finding a sense of ease with the breath, finding a sense of ease with being able to settle down. Simply by breathing and gaining sense of well-being, rapture, equanimity when you need them.
In this way you nourish the mind with good food. It's right livelihood in the highest sense. So you're in a position where you, while you're alive this time around, you you weigh lightly on the world around you. And you're developing the skill so that you don't have to come back and weigh the world down again. This is why the Buddha's teachings are not selfish. They're an act of kindness, both for you and for the whole world around you. <laughs>